and we deal with exhibition pieces and also uh, large-scale works. And at any given time, we probably have maybe 150 pieces in production. Some of the, uh, the large projects extend between uh, three to five years, and the smaller exhibition pieces maybe a month or so. And the studio really is not a, uh, a factory, but really is a area for investigation. And one of the reasons I'm here is just to explore form, specifically, you know, here with uh, glass form. And um, very early on, about 35 years ago, I started forging metal, uh, which you would think of as kind of traditional uh, blacksmithing, that you would you heat up the, uh, the steel, and when the steel is a yellow heat, uh, you then forge it, twist it, bend it, fold it. And um, even though the iron is quite different of a material than glass, the form development is very similar. That you're, You have a given mass and you just change and alter that mass in reference to heat. So with this integration uh, of, uh, of dealing with steel and glass, for me it's kind of a fundamental uh, relationship of, uh, of form development. In... Um, the, uh, the late 90s, I was asked to go to Pilchuck, and it was the first time that I actually got involved uh, with glass work. And since that time, I've had several different sessions at various universities and other glass studios, developing a body of work like you see here, taking it back and then developing the, um, the sculpture around it. What I'd like to do with this, uh, with this talk is leave some time afterwards for a question and answer session because I have no idea what you're thinking about or what your perspectives might be. So what I thought I would do with this slide lecture is just to give you an overview of how I got started uh, you know, in uh, this, uh, this whole process and, uh, and, its, uh, and its evolution. Uh, this is my, actually I just moved my studio, so this uh, this is my previous studio, but this is where all the work uh, came from. This is in, uh, in Rochester. We have the, uh, the two bottom floors of this building. The bottom floor is a, um, an exhibition area. The top is where my offices are. And then, uh, because a lot of the, uh, the large-scale work, as I said, goes over such a long period of time that the... Um, Oh, all the structural engineering, the cost analysis, the tracking of the work, and all of that has to happen. Uh, half of the staff staff is devoted to administration. I have a um, I have a director, a project manager, an accountant, um, and uh, and a foreman that uh, help, and two archivists. And here you can see the uh, this was the uh, the formal working area. It's a 30 foot high uh, crane bay with a uh, 30 ton crane. This is where all of the, uh, the fabrication would take place. In the process uh, of that, one of the rooms is dedicated to design. With large-scale work, obviously, you just can't uh, start. It has to have a whole developmental section. So I go through a series of drawings, uh, very, very fast drawings, you know, a couple hundred. And then from there, the drawing obviously is, uh, is flat. So in order to understand the three-dimensional nature of form, I'll go to... Um, uh, usually a cardboard uh, model and then from the cardboard model we usually go to a metal model where all of the um, structural engineering and logistics is figured out and then finally into uh, production and also I have another studio which is a forging studio which you would think of as a traditional kind of a blacksmith studio there we have uh, various uh, uh, pneumatic uh, power hammers and drop hammers we can forge uh, uh, three or five inch uh, thick steel. And here you can see that kind of plasticity of the iron when it's hot, very similar to what you were seeing here with the, uh, with the glass. Oh, God. I did uh, kind of a traditional fine arts training at Tyler School of Art, part of Temple University. Uh, this was in the early 60s. I did my undergraduate and graduate work there. And these are some very early drawings. The uh, foundation program really stressed the reliance of um, organic form and observation from nature. So, uh, you know, dealing with, with gesture, dealing with movement, dealing with uh, complexity of form, which is very much part of the natural world, 
was part of the uh, my development um, as an artist. And you can see they're uh, extremely, extremely literal. My earlier work in sculpture, I, my undergraduate was in sculpture, was in uh, stone and wood carving. And here you can see it was very, uh, very, very academic uh, modeling, uh, dealing with the, uh, the human figure, dealing with uh, the quality of line as far as in contour and also uh, with shadow. You know, the deeper you carve the, sh the uh, stone, the darker the shadow begins. So you're really articulating light and shade rather than the material itself. Also, in those very early years, uh, dealing with different materials, I mean, what, what kind of form is appropriate for stone? What kind of form is appropriate for wood? Um, what are the unique characteristics of the material? And, you know, how do they manifest themselves? So this is the whole kind of questioning process that was developed early on that uh, keeps on informing the, um, informing the work. It's kind of an exercise in humility. It's a very early, uh, early shot. Um, and as you can see, as the work developed, I took the principles of organic form, and here you can see these kind of stylized bird shapes. But we start to get into more uh, formal uh, interaction of, uh, of formal relationships. You know, to the point that the figurative aspect is totally gone, and we're just dealing with the abs abstraction of, uh, of that. Uh, in the late 60s, I became involved in forging iron, and uh, iron allowed me to uh, really explore this, this aspect of organic form and plastic form. Uh, this is about, the uh, candlestick is about four foot long, and you can see that very sinuous line, you know, very similar to the lines that you, uh, that you see here. One thing that iron allowed me to do was to work in larger scale. Uh, this is a candlestick that's uh, six foot tall. My initial involvement with the metal was within the decorative arts uh, vocabulary, uh, uh, plant stands, uh, mirrors, chandeliers, that type of thing. In the early 70s, there was a competition for gates for the Renwick Gallery. This was a very early sketch uh, for that. There was uh, several people that were asked to um, uh, come up with some designs. Uh, this uh, I won the competition. This is my first uh, studio in 1972, and I hired my first uh, apprentice because a lot of the uh, the uh, processes of metalwork are uh, are a two-person operation. So here the iron is heated. Uh, I'm I'm holding an auxiliary tool, and then my apprentice here is making an imprint. You know, very similar to the the interplay that happens here with uh, with people on the floor. And also there are a lot of uh, very basic power equipment. This is a drop hammer and a lathe. And got that. So it took uh, the two of us a year, and this is what we developed. My God, it's forged steel, uh, copper, and uh, brass. And here's some of the, uh, some of the details. A lot of the joining, like the bands that you see, are structural bands. You heat them, you put them around the material, it shrinks and it creates a, a bond. Uh, so what I tried to do is to create um, an aesthetic vocabulary for these necessary uh, technical components. Even the, well, uh, after, after the gates, I just wanted to explore uh, just this uh, lyricism of form. This is now in the Worcester Museum. It's 21 foot long and uh, 13 foot high. It's just kind of drawing in space. You know, so here the structural necessity to cantilever the form becomes the main uh, design element in the piece. This is one of the uh, terminations of one of the elements. And as you can see, uh, one form is totally different from the other. However, you can see within the progression of form that one form determines the other. And this is a, uh, a process that I use in my uh, designing of dealing with seemingly contradictory forms, but put them in within a context, this context that they unify themselves. Uh, with my, uh, the work in iron, uh, it allowed me to start to interface with architecture. This was a, um, a large fence we did for Hunter Museum of Art in Chattanooga, Tennessee. The fence goes right and left of the, uh, the old building that you see on the river bluff. 
And in this way, the, uh, the fence uh, creates this uh, very uh, lyrical statement between the uh, buildings. It was 130 foot long. This is a, um, a 40 foot section. You can see that kind of gestural uh, ebb and flow of the line. And also with um, architectural work, there's two senses of scale. One is architectural scale of how the artwork relates to the, um, uh, to the proportions of the building and the landscape design. And then the other is how it relates to a pedestrian when they walk up. So here, for instance, there's a lot of details that are only shown in uh, close proximity to the, uh, the intimacy of the, um, of the viewer. Because of the work that I've done in the Smithsonian, this is the state capitol in Albany, New York. Uh, I did a, uh, two uh, gates that were uh, 15 foot tall. My studio had grown, this is 1980, studio had grown to uh, six people. Our technology was about 1850, uh, you know, with sledgehammers and uh, pry bars and etc. We did start to get involved. The mechanical hammers then went to pneumatic hammers. This is a 30-ton um, uh, imprint in the forging process. So that taper was then uh, pulled around forms. We did two uh, double gates, so there was four identical panels. So these iron uh, forms or mandrels, you would wrap the uh, heated steel around. Here you can see the uh, development uh, of the work. This won the, um, uh, my first uh, American Institute of Architects award. The quality of the craftsmanship is similar to the stone carving you see. The coloration uh, relates to the chandelier. And then even the interlocking arcs that you see uh, are very reminiscent of the uh, groin vault of the, um, of the building. This was a H.H. H. Richardson building. It was built in uh, 1881. And these were, the gates went on the uh, Senate uh, uh, chambers, on either side of the Senate chambers. And this is the first time that uh, terrorism started to be talked about in federal buildings. And this was part of the uh, restoration of that building. And that's the final, um, the final piece. This top crusting are uh, forged uh, bronze elements that you see, approximately four foot tall. This was a very... Um, a quick sketch um, for a sculpture for a strong museum uh, in Rochester. All the work previous to this was more or less kind of a um, architectural element, meaning a fence, a gate, a fountain, a chandelier. This was the first uh, freestanding sculpture. My understanding of form was through forging, so you can see that the forms are very much uh, of the forged vocabulary, but I couldn't forge anything this big because it was going to be 35 foot long and 20 foot high. So I interpreted the forging and hollow fabrication. So here you can see uh, this is core 10 steel plates that are hydraulically formed and then welded together and ground. We had to build a, um, an addition onto my studio in order to, uh, to build this piece. Technically, it became involved with welding, and there's a lot of distortion with welding, so we used hydraulic jacks to straighten things out. There's an interior structure, very much a uh, development. <clears throat> Here you can see its main, um, its main view from the road. It's seen as a signature piece for the museum. You see the top of the sculpture uh, breaks the, um, the, uh, the skyline of the building, and also the sculpture penetrates into the ground. So in many ways, the sculpture, even though different, becomes a uh, transitional element that helps unify the architectonic nature of the building and that of the landscape design. And even the form itself, you can see, in one way is organic, but at the same time is dealing with geometry. So it's a way to help uh, unify, the, uh, unify the space. With this dialogue of architecture, I was drawn into various projects. This is the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C., the main entrance, uh, we did the bronze handles of the, uh, the building. So you touch the handles, you look at the main axis, you see the sculpture in the back, so you get this connectedness um, through the passage of the building. So here you can see the, uh, this pedestrian arena by the, um, the elevators. The crenellation at the top of the sculpture relates to the, uh, 
the profile of the ceiling. And you can see the uh, parquet in the floor color is related to the sculpture and also the bronze in the, uh, in the elevator. And this also was another kind of hybrid element. Uh, I was still dealing with forging, but also now dealing with fabrication, you know, the basis of hollow construction. Here you can see some of the, uh, the detailing. And for me, um, we all deal, we deal primarily with uh, one-of-a-kind projects. Every project I learn from something, which then uh, begets the next project. I really like this whole sense of this foundation and the forged elements. So we did this as an exhibition piece. This is uh, 12 foot high and uh, eight and a half foot across. These are forged and fabricated elements. Uh, this was purchased by a client in uh, Tokyo and a corporate headquarters, which uh, where it now is. These are uh, uh, heat formed uh, steel ribbons that are then, or, or steel plate that is then used uh, metallic uh, paints to create this uh, iridescent kind of ephemeral uh, passage. That whole sense of gesture, uh, these were some drawings for a ceremonial archway, part of a uh, competition in um, uh, Philadelphia, in uh, Franklin Town, 17th and Buttonwood. This was the drawing. Um, it goes into a, a complex, so it's a ceremonial archway. It's uh, 30 foot high and 90 foot across. Here you can see the two pylons being worked on in the studio. And even at that scale, every weld joint is ground and refined, and uh, the quality is always something that's, uh, and the craftsmanship is very much a concern. So here you can see the context of the sculpture now becomes the skyline of the city and how it articulates that profile. And this is the first time we started to use lighting. It uh, becomes quite a uh, prominent sentinel at night. So within a city, uh, city streets are usually fairly ubiquitous. And here you can see that this ceremonial archway defines the entrance and also the identity for the complex. Shortly after that, I was um, <clears throat> I received a phone call from uh, an architect in um, uh, Houston, and they were doing the uh, Houston Center of Performing Arts. And as you can see, this is the uh, the model. Uh, you can see inside there, there's uh, there's trees within the archway. So I received this call, it was kind of interesting, and the, and the architect said, are you the, uh, the sculptor that does large-scale metal sculptures? And I said, yeah, yes, I've, I've done something like that. He says, have you ever worked on the, with plexiglass? And I said, well, years ago I worked with plexiglass, but I really don't use it, but I know how to use it. And he said, uh, he says, good, he says, well, we have this problem. Because initially what they're going to have is this alley of palm trees that went up to the building, and then inside this model, you can see the palm trees would go up, you know, into the building along the staircase. So he said, um, because of the air conditioning and the lack of light, he said that the, um, uh, the trees inside would die. So what we thought you could do is that we could, you could make stainless steel trees and then uh, green plexiglass fronds. He said, could you do such a thing? And I said, well, I said I could do it, but I'm not... He says, well, that's good, because he says we also have a problem of uh, lighting in this big uh, atrium area. And he says that the, um, that the palm trees could have coconuts, and the coconuts could be swivel lights. And it could, um, it could light up the interior. So I said, well, I said, let me, uh, let me come down and talk to you. So I, I went down and, uh, and talked to him. And um, I said, well, this was during the oil embargo in the early 80s. And... So they said, well, what we wanted to do was to create this grand staircase, this sense of uh, celebration uh, for this opera house, the Wortham, Wortham Center. And, um, and we just thought that, the, uh, that these palm trees would humanize the space. And uh, So anyhow, I went back and I thought about it, and this is the design I came up with. These would be eight sculptures that would start at 15 foot and go up to 30 foot. And these stylized banner shapes would divide that big space to create uh, kind of an intimacy. You can see where these people are standing under the banners, like as, as if you stood under the bough of a tree. It, cre it breaks up the space and creates this intimate relationship. Just to get a sense of scale, 
those pod-like shapes that you see on the top of the sculptures. Here's one being produced in the studio. I mean, there's literally thousands of pieces of steel that were heated and formed and uh, welded together. Uh, at that time, I was in the middle of moving to another studio. We were working outside because uh, the piece was uh, so large. We then moved into the uh, studio, which I just showed you. Uh, this is where the, uh, the pieces were sandblasted and then polychromed. And we also put uh, gold leafing on the edge. So here you can see the final installation. There's uh, eight sculptures going from 15 to 30 foot. Besides getting bigger, they get more colorful as they go up and more active. So there's a sense of uh, progression uh, as you go up. And here you can see the, uh, the largest ones on the, um, the spring line of the building. And here at night, you can barely see it, but along the front of the building, that archway is 150 foot tall. You can see there's uh, bronze handles. Uh, so here you actually touch the handle, which is similar to the, um, to the sculpture. You go in, the first sculpture is about human proportion. You go up, and then uh, finally uh, you become part of the composition. You go to the inner sanctum of the building. There's another set of handles that are different uh, where you go to the opera boxes. So that, that sense of architectural progression is amplified by the, uh, by the sculpture as it goes through the, um, through the building. And when we went to the, uh, the airport for the opening, uh, this was a, a, a billboard that was up at the, muse at, at the airport for the grand opening. And you can see that they used the sculptures uh, for um, the identity of the building. And in many ways, uh, a sculpture has the identity to work in this symbolic context, and a lot of the works have become uh, symbols uh, for the complexes. Um, a theme that runs throughout my work is this act of passage. You saw the, the ceremonial archway, the gates, uh, the Wortham Center. This never happened, but just to show you this was for the Mint Museum in uh, Charlotte. Um, uh, so this was a kind of a ceremonial archway that was going to be the entrance to the building. We usually go from, uh, from drawings to cardboard models and then finally uh, to the final production. So that's kind of the, the design phase that we're engaged in. This was a similar approach here for, um, this was Hardy Holtzman, a Pfeiffer architect for Columbia Museum in Columbia, Missouri. Now the sculptures go against the building, and you walk through the sculptures into the building. So they do become this kind of ceremonial portal. Here you can see the sculptures being done uh, at, uh, this was another studio that I uh, leased. They're uh, 45 foot tall. And here you can see how they relate uh, to the building and the space. You can see here, the, uh, I emphasize the silhouette by, uh, by painting uh, the silhouette edges red. And you can see that whole complexity of light and shade and how it relates to the, um, say, the rusticated stone of the building. That whole sense of the sculpture integrating into the space to help uh, unify the experience. So in one way, the sculpture amplifies the, um, the building and the quality of the building amplifies the sculpture. And hopefully this uh, synergy is created uh, by them. This is another work we did in uh, Toronto up in the theatrical district. Um, that was the drawing. This was a relief sculpture that hung on the front of the building. The sculpture kind of hangs down and then we did also the, um, the, uh, the door handles which are 13 foot tall so you actually grab the sculpture, you grab the handles and you you walk through and here's the, uh, the stainless steel kind of draping down into the uh, into the pedestrian area. My sculpture, I mean, my studio is structured around large-scale work. However, we do uh, several exhibitions a year. This is a recent exhibition that was just in uh, outside of New York City at Grounds for Sculpture. This is some of the more uh, the more recent work. A lot of it has to do with the play of uh, organic form and. Uh, in reference to um, a geometric form. Here, this is kind of uh, dealing symbolically, again, with this, uh, actually the piece is called portal, so you have the stylized entranceway, which you can literally uh, walk through. 
This uh, core 10 steel is welded and fabricated and hydraulically formed. This was another one called uh, Persinium. It's out of uh, stainless steel. The elements were, uh, the central elements were drawn and then scanned into a computer and then uh, the stainless plate was laser cut. This is inch and a half thick stainless and then formed. And all the, this, the very tight bending is done with heat. These are all hollow fabrication that's, um, they're ground and refined. This is a recent project in um, uh, uh, Trenton, New Jersey for a train station. There's a main uh, intersection inside the city. The building was very geometric, so what I wanted to do is uh, to counterbalance that with this colorful piece. This was the, um, the maquette for that. Here's the fabrication the studio and its final um, resolution. It, these are just some of the more recent ones. This is a uh, polychrome piece in Fort Myers, Florida, about 30 foot tall. We didn't see that one. With this, too, I'm involved because the painting isn't direct because you can see the colors are uh, blended and faded. So I do, uh, I do all the painting as well. The small bit of color at the bottom is AT&T in Atlanta, Georgia. This was the maquette for a 45-foot uh, sculpture. And so the sculpture now becomes the basis for a pedestrian plaza. So the plaza acts as kind of an entrance or a transition uh, into the uh, building. And these tumbling squares kind of come down into the pedestrian arena, so the sculpture really engages the, um, the people. This was a very quick drawing for uh, Bosch & Lomb corporate headquarters in, uh, in Rochester, the optical firm. This was to be a central uh, <coughs> elliptical plaza in front of the building. I designed the plaza that it has these tiered plateaus. There was a, uh, a documentary that won an award that was played on television in several cities uh, on, this, uh, on this piece. So from the, uh, the cardboard and wood model, we went to a metal model. This is 85 foot tall. Here you can see the main uh, structure. We had to do it horizontally because of the scale. And even at this scale, uh, it's all hand work. I mean, all of the, the forming, the bending, the heating, the grinding. This was about uh, eight months worth of work. And here you can see this elliptical area. The front of the building is concave. And so the whole complex kind of swirls around the, uh, around the sculpture. And here you can see its uh, context. You have the, the rational kind of geometric of, of the cityscape and then this, uh, the counterbalance of that, this uh, uh, organic uh, passage uh, of the sculpture. Here's another uh, one in, um, oh, I forget where this is, Roanoke, Virginia. And again, it's just a playing off of the contrast of the, um, of this um, very uh, geometric, rational building uh, with the sculpture. And what I try to do is accentuate the, um, the profile of the sculpture. Here you can see this kind of... Um, um, expressionistic handling uh, of the uh, the paint and also the uh, the definition of the edge which is uh, which is very important and even though it's a three-dimensional form that sense of silhouette and contour is so important you can see this here in uh, you know dusk and dawn you can see that the qual even though these are massive three-dimensional forms the quality of line still plays a uh, a very very important role in the piece for instance, this sculpture here, um, so basically with sculpture you have, you have space and you have material, whatever that material is. And the only thing that defines the space and the material characteristic is the edge of the sculpture. So for instance here, uh, that edge that you see uh, on the, um, the right-hand side, 
uh, the line, uh, which is steel, uh, penetrates into the space. And if you continue around, that line then uh, has the space penetrating into the steel. And this photograph uh, specifically, I think I feel that there's a real balance of the spatial relationships of uh, the, how space plays a role and material plays a role. And basically, this all starts with drawing, which is basically you know a line on a piece of paper. And then that gets more complex as the uh, sculptures develop. The whole as aspect of drawing and the quality of line became the basis of an exhibition called Inspiration and Context that dealt with the aspect of drawing. Drawing takes many, many different facets. You can have, uh, say, an idea or a conceptual drawing where you, you're thinking of something and you want to record it or drawing as a thought process where you can put a line down, you respond to the line, or presentation drawings where it's a fine rendering that you you give to a, um, a client. So this exhibition uh, explored all of those aspects of drawing and then also the three-dimensional models that come through that. But also uh, drawing is a way for me to experience form but also to develop form. So here, that quality of drawing, that very kind of staccato uh, movement of the hand, with this drawing here was the basis for a federal project in um, Asheville, North Carolina. And here you can see how it's uh, presented in the, uh, in the steel. This is a 48 foot tall piece. It was cut in uh, two pieces, uh, trucked to the site. And here, this play of light and shade and this uh, staccato line, how it plays off the geometry of the federal building on the left. And um, I know this is on the, on the corner of, two, of a major intersection. People walk up the stairs, and I saw that they walk diagonally across the plaza. So I put the sculpture right in the middle of the plaza and opened it at the base so they walk through it to experience almost kind of in a uh, architecturally related way that sense of space um, as, a, as if you're walking through say a, the grove of trees and at night as well lighting became a, a major uh, feature this was drawing for a piece we did uh, three years ago uh, called um, Epoch in Washington DC that was the drawing the developmental model Here's the fabrication. It's a highly polychromed work. It's for the entrance of a complex, and again, you walk through it. I work with the uh, poet, uh, poet laureate of Washington, D.C., uh, um, Dolores Kendrick, and she developed a poem based on her experience with the sculpture, and the, uh, the, the poem was uh, stamped uh, into the steel. So when you walk into kind of the inside of the sculpture and you're viewing the space, uh, there's the on the um, on the sculpture you read the poem and uh, relate to that. This act of passage was another one for Adobe Systems in um, uh, uh, San Jose, California. I was asked uh, they were doing a new corporate headquarters and they asked me to come down and. Uh, uh, they wanted to create a sculpture for the main plaza and become a symbol of the corporation. And of course, I had known, you know, uh, Adobe Systems and everything they had done in reference to computer programming. And so, when I was dealing with the CEO and the president, they said that they wanted a sculpture that, re that reflected the um, the, uh, the corporation. And um, and they said, we really want it to be characteristic of what we were about. And so, luckily, I asked them, well, you know, what are you about? And they said, well, technically we've done uh, several uh, innovations with uh, computer technology and programming, but everything we do becomes obsolete in about six months. And he says that what we want to do is to have our company defined by uh, human creativity. So I started thinking about that. That was kind of my design charge. So like on a computer, when all the various pages um, you know, come up and you click and things move and you go in deeper and and deeper into the uh, into the program, uh, you re receive information, uh, you come out, and so in many ways it's a, uh, a ceremonial act of passage. And so here, this the sculpture becomes almost a metaphor uh, for that passage that you take, because when you <clears throat> when you go in, you receive information, your ideas change, and you're totally transformed when you come out again. 
So this was, uh, became this archway. You can see the scale. You literally walk through this archway as you um, go into the building. The side of the sculpture goes into a reflecting pool and then comes up the other end. And that's uh, core 10 steel, uh, bronze, and um, a lot of the earlier program with Adobe was dealing with letter forms, so that was part of it as well. Here you can see the, uh, the kind of drawing that was developed for um, Naples Museum. It's bronze, stainless, and core 10. Yeah, Naples! And this has become the main entrance uh, of the building. I'm going to go through these a little bit faster so you can... Uh, well, this is, this is uh, Toledo, University of Toledo. There's a main plaza and there's a seating unit around the base. This is a very interesting problem. Uh, this is an old building they converted into a museum. This is Iowa State University. This was the drawing I developed for a sculpture that becomes the entrance of the building. Here you can see the heating and bending of the forms. This was uh, uh, laser cut stainless steel. And you walk up uh, right and left of the um, of the sculpture into the atrium area and then on the back wall there's uh, forms as well so again it's this uh, transitional aspect these are some very rough drawings for uh, Central Park Zoo uh, that uh, ne never materialized and then a, um, a person on a tour came through 25 years later uh, saw the drawings and wanted to uh, buy this for the St. Louis Zoo. So I took that design. It became a uh, three and a half year design phase. This very intricate uh, model. With this, the first uh, literal form that I did with uh, stylized the trees and animals. This was the model for the sculpture. It's proposed at 130 foot long and 50 foot high. Weighs 100 ton. The first animals were quite small, so we did them uh, larger, so the steel would indicate uh, feathers or stripes of a zebra. Just a massive design phase. So here you see the cardboard model of a baby elephant. We did it in metal to make sure the metal would do what the cardboard did, and then you can see it being produced in the back. So here you see the scale of the work. So it's a, it goes from a savanna into a jungle into a water situation. So this is the main plaza in front of the St. Louis Zoo. So you walk you walk through this to experience the uh, the forms. This is a steel corporation in Rochester, New York, that uh, I dealt with. They just moved to a new facility, and they wanted me to do a sculpture. I've had like a 40-year relationship with them. And so I had just completed the, um, the, uh, the zoo sculpture. So I wanted a sculpture that represented their business. So they sell I-beams and tubes. And also, if you want a piece of steel cut, they cut the steel. They cut all the steel for the, for the zoo. So these are some very early drawings I did. This was the model you can see with the steel beams. That white passage or the... Um, are the cutout plates. You can see at the bottom of where the model is, these are the plates that the, all the images of the zoo were cut out of, and this is what's called the drops, which is just scrap that they would throw away. So instead of throwing it away, I use them as kind of uh, transparent screens. So all of the joints here are, uh, were engineered. Here you can see the uh, metal model. All the photographs were taken of these drops. Here's one of the drops. You can see partial animals in there and trees and various things. They were then put on this um, structural grid. It was very, very involved uh, structural engineering. There was Every angle was uh, computer generated because all these forms had to be cut and welded when they were on the ground. This was on a landfill, so it's this massive uh, concrete pad that was five foot thick.
It's 85 foot tall, and here you get this play of light and shade and positive negative shapes. You know, what was a plant form or what was an animal form? You see it, uh, you know, in the kind of the negative, which is the, the spatial thing. And here you can get a sense, uh, sense of that. And during the day, I mean, it's not kinetic, but during the day, the, the way the light and the, the shade pattern, it's just really, it's almost like a camouflage thing that's happened. And it's painted safety yellow, so it's very much what the industry's about. And you look up into the sky, you can see all these various uh, forms of floating in space. You have rain, we have snow. I mean, this is what Rochester's like this time of year. I'm going to go through these faster. Yeah, this was a, a sculpture I did for um, Rochester Institute of Technology. There was a movie uh, done on this. These are the major forms. Again, this is 85 foot tall. It was so large, uh, the forms were just big enough to get it on a truck, and we fabricated it on site. Those... Uh, those kind of banner shapes, uh, each one of them weighs about uh, 7,000 pounds. This is a project outside of uh, Arlington, West Virginia for a complex. It's a 100 foot tall work. That's the, uh, that's the entrance uh, to the complex. Oh, and then because of the work that I did at the zoo, there's a major plaza with uh, with two uh, eagles. That define the uh, the plaza. It's on the Potomac, so you look across the Potomac and you see the Washington Monument on the other side. Oh, I forgot these were in here. Uh, as I said, I had started my work in forging. I very rarely forge now because it's so labor intensive. But these were um, drawings for the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. It was built in uh, 18, it's, it was, they started it in uh, 1907. It was completed in 2007. And this was the last chapel, it was the Chapel of the Good Shepherd. Uh, and this was a uh, forge gate that, um, that was put into that complex probably the most complex forging uh, that I've uh, accomplished. I'm going to go through this fast because I'm going to get the glass and steel. Uh, this was a um, this was initially a, a small uh, sculpture I did for an exhibition. I was asked by um, the federal government in Mexico to do a 100 foot tall sculpture uh, and from this uh, we did generated this uh, maquette you can see from the scale of the pedestrian, the scale, here it is being done. The, the two colors it's being painted on site. It's the Sierra Madre Mountains in the background. That's again a hundred foot tall uh, work. And this was uh, just completed in um, Council Bluffs, Iowa. We did four sculptures on a um, on a bridge, each one comparable to a six-story building. This was the initial drawing. This was the maquette. Here's the development uh, of the uh, sculptures. It's stainless steel, uh, core ten, and bronze, and that's the final uh, the final shot. In uh, the uh, late 90s, I was asked to go to uh, Pilchuck as an artist in residence to experience glass and so I approached the glass the same way I had approached the uh, steel by compressing it, delineating it, trying to understand that kind of form context and I would, I would develop the work like I did here, I would take it back to my studio and then integrate it with metal and since that time I've done uh, several, uh, I've done about uh, 75 uh, sculptures integrating uh, glass and steel. This was a uh, session that I uh, did with Martin Blank uh, many about seven years ago. 
And also I worked with uh, Bill Carlson uh, when he was at uh, Champaign-Urbana with uh, cast glass. So the glass becomes the, uh, the main uh, impetus for the uh, sculptures. So here you can see the twisted glass form and then the twisted steel next to it. So you get that relationship one to the other. These are some uh, upset forms of two hot rods of glass being put together just like you saw a little while ago. It's about five foot tall, the uh, sculpture. That's a pulled piece of glass. This was some, some cast glass as well. So anyhow, so this is the, um, and for me, because I work on such a large scale, that these are just exercises of experiencing form and experiencing composition. Actually, this glass, the glass itself is about four and a half foot across. That uh, weighs uh, about 300 pounds. And that's a fabricated uh, stainless piece. So that sense of complexity, that sense of integration, sense of structure that you saw in the other work is uh, the same kind of uh, vocabulary that I use with the, um, with the glass and steel. Uh, this was a, a client had seen some of the sculptures and wanted me to do a front entrance door for them. So these were the drawings that were developed. They selected the um, uh, upper right uh, drawing. And then that was, uh, so I did the forged and the cast glass for the door, uh, the door and then there was uh, the uh, blown forms that you see that slip into the... Uh, to the glass. There are several pieces of glass left over, so we did this sculpture. This sculpture is uh, 10 foot tall. So, if anybody has any uh, questions, I'd be uh, glad to answer them at this time. Yes. Oh no, I, this was just, I, this was the beginning of the lecture. This was just some of the early drawings. I just, uh, I just wanted to show you the, uh, where it all started. Yes? Yeah, what the question was, if um, I'm trying to paraphrase you, what the question was that I was so hands-on in the development of this with the large-scale work and with all the people that it goes through, at what point do I let go? Is that what you're saying? No. No, I don't let go. No. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm kind of a control freak. I don't know if you've, <laughs> if you've uh, gathered that or not. But... Um, for me, the whole idea, for me personally, as an artist, is the is the exploration of form, and for me to experience different form realities. Um, and so, when I'm doing the drawing, I'm thinking of uh, different, you know, new form con 